Section 27 of The Critique of Dogmatic Theology, An Investigation of the Christian Teaching by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Leo Weiner. Chapter 17, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Section 27. Chapter 17, Part 1. Of God as the Judge and Retributor. Here the didactic part of the theology is really ended. The doctrine about the sacraments is the aim and crown of all. It is necessary to prove to people that their salvation does not lie in them, but depends on the hierarchy which can sanctify and save them. All men have to do is to obey and seek salvation, paying the clergy for it in honors and money. The next chapter is really not a teaching, but a threat, which will incite the flock to have recourse to the hierarchy. Here is a short recapitulation of the doctrine from the beginning. 247. Connection with the preceding. Conception of God as the judge and retributor, and the composition of the church doctrine about it. Quote, For the full rehabilitation and salvation of fallen man, it was necessary to perform three great acts. A. To reconcile the sinner with God, whom he has infinitely offended by his fall. b. To cleanse the sinner from sins and make him righteous and holy. c. To free the sinner from the punishments themselves for his sins and to present to him the benefits which he has earned in accordance with his sanctity. Article 124. The first act the Lord God achieved himself without our participation when he sent down upon earth his only begotten Son, who, having become incarnate, and having taken upon himself the sins of the whole human race, has by his death brought full satisfaction to eternal justice, and in this manner has not only redeemed us from sins and from punishments for sins, but has also made us partake of the gifts of the Holy Ghost and of eternal happiness. Article 153. The second act the Lord God achieves with our cooperation. He has founded on earth his holy church, as a living and constant instrument for our purification from sin and for our sanctification. He sends down to us the Church, and through the Church, the grace of the Holy Ghost, as an actual force, which purifies us from sins and sanctifies us. He has established various sacraments in the Church for communicating to us the various gifts of this saving grace, in conformity with all the needs of our spiritual life. And it lies with us whether we shall make use, or not, of the means of sanctification which God offers to us. End quote. God took pity on men who were perishing from their evil will and redeemed them. But the condition of men after the redemption remained the same as it had been in the time of Adam and the patriarchs. Just as they who were before the redemption had to look for salvation, so we must do, who come after the redemption. The difference between the condition of the Old Testament and that of grace is this that then there did not exist the mechanical means of the sacraments, but now it exists. The difference is this, that Jacob and Abraham could save themselves by their good lives, by the fulfillment of God's will in life, and now we can be saved through sacraments. All that would seem to be very nice, but with this teaching, it would seem, it would be impossible to recognize retribution, because retribution results from the absolutely free activity of man, while with salvation through the sacraments, man is not free. Salvation through good works differs from any other in that it is absolutely free. A man is for moral good as free on the cross as at home, but the salvation through the sacraments does not fully, and sometimes does not at all, depend on the will of man, so that, in spite of the whole desire to be baptized, anointed, communed, man may not have the chance to be so. Consequently, Retribution appears as unjust, when grace is taken into consideration. Adam could be punished for the apple, he could have eaten, or not eaten it. But a punishment because a man had no chance or possibility to be baptized or to commune, such a punishment destroys the idea of God's justice, and that is precisely what results from church grace. According to the Old Testament, God is represented as crude and cruel, but nonetheless just. According to the new grace, as the hierarchy teaches it, he is represented as an unjust judge, as one gone mad, 
who punishes men for what is beyond their will. Evidently, one cannot get away from the laws of reason. The first error, or lie, of the redemption led up to the greater lie of grace, and grace led to a still greater lie, to the faith of obedience, and this again to the mechanical actions of the sacraments. The necessity of an incitement for the performance of the sacraments led up to retribution, and that teaching has found its expression in a horrifying monstrosity. God, to save all men, gave his son up to execution, and from this it follows that if a pope is too late with his sacrament when I am dying, I shall go, if not directly to hell, somewhere where I shall be much worse off than he who has stolen a lot of money and has hired a pope, or several popes, to be always about him. That is not a misuse, but a direct conclusion. But that does not embarrass the theology. It says, quote, The first thing is that God has saved us. The second thing is that he has given us sacraments. The third thing that the Lord God achieves after the performance of the second, which he achieves with our help, he then appears as the judge of men, who justly weighs our deserts, whether we have made proper use or not, of the means of purification from sins and of sanctification which he has given us on earth, and whether we are worthy or not to be freed from punishments for sins and to receive happiness. He appears thereupon as a just retributor who determines the due part for each man according to his deserts. End quote. The means against it are the sacraments. Then follows the usual exposition. In the retribution, all three persons of the Trinity take part. Section 248. The circumstance which prepares the private judgment. Man's death. Death is spoken of as something new and unknown to anybody. The cause of death is the fall of the first man. And from the first man we took that habit. All that is proved. 249. The actuality of the private judgment. It is proved that after death there takes place a private judgment of man in distinction from the general judgment. The judgment, that is, a certain process of investigation and the retribution which follows from it, is ascribed to omniscient and all good God. 250. Representation of the private judgment. Teaching about the torments. Quote, Holy Scripture does not tell us how a private judgment takes place, but an objective representation of this judgment, based mainly on the holy tradition and in agreement with Holy Scripture, we find in the teaching about the torments, which has existed since antiquity in the Orthodox Church. End quote. The torments are described and confirmed by Holy Scripture on ten pages. We are told that, quote, At the parting of our soul from our body, there will arise before us, on the one hand, a host of the heavenly powers, and on the other, the powers of darkness, the evil keepers of the world, the aerial chiefs of torments, the inquisitors, and the arraigners of our deeds. Upon seeing them, the soul will be excited, and will be convulsed and tremble, and in confusion and terror will seek for defense among the angels of God, but even when it will be accepted by the holy angels, and under their protection will flip through the aerial spaces and rise to the height, it will encounter various torments, as it were barriers or toll-gates, where taxes are collected, which will bar its way to the kingdom, and will stop and arrest its striving toward it. At each of these torments an account of some special sins will be demanded. At the first torment, of the sins committed by means of the lips and mouth. At the second torment, the sins of vision. At the third, the sins of hearing. At the fourth, the sins of smell. At the fifth, of all lawlessness and abominable deeds done by means of the hands. To the other torments belong the other sins, such as anger, hatred, envy, vanity, and pride. In short, every passion, every passion of the soul, every sin will similarly have its tormentors and inquisitors. End quote. 252. Retribution to the righteous. A. Their glorification in heaven, in the church triumphant. Quote, Retribution for the righteous, by the will of the heavenly judge, also has two forms. A. Their glorification, though not yet complete in heaven, in the church triumphant, and B. Their glorification upon earth, in the church militant. End quote. It is hard to understand how the word glorification occupies such an important place in the teaching of the Church, especially when one thinks of Christ's teachings, which is constantly directed against glory, and one feels with his heart that the love of glory, of glorification, is one of the most petty of human feelings. I can understand as a reward the contemplation of God, peace, 
paradise, Eden, even Muhammad's paradise, nirvana. But in order to understand the reward in glorification, I have to imagine myself in the place of the crudest of men or when I was only 15 years old. But the theology regards glorification as a great reward. This glorification is represented to consist in this, that wreaths will be put on them and that they will be in honor and glory. That is proved from Holy Scripture. 253. The glorification of the righteous upon earth in the church militant. A. The worship of the saints. Quote, At the same time that the righteous judge and retributor honors the righteous after their decease with a glorification, anticipatory though it be, in heaven, in the church triumphant, he honors them also with a glorification upon earth in the church militant. End quote. This glory is again represented in the form of wreaths, gold, precious stones, obeisances, censors, singing, masses, and so forth. Then follows controversies with those who do not consider it necessary to worship the saints in such a way. All that is proved from Scripture. 254b. Invocation of the Saints. Quote, Respecting the saints, as true servants, favorites, and friends of God, the Holy Church at the same time invokes them in its prayers, not as some gods who might help us by their own power, but as our intercessors before God, the only sources and distributors of all the gifts and favors to the creatures, as our representatives and intercessors who have the power of mediation from Christ, who alone is in the proper sense the independent mediator between God and men, who gave himself a ransom for all. Holy Scripture teaches us that dogma." End quote. It is a dogma. The dogma consists in this, that, a, it is necessary to pray to the saints, b, that the saints hear us, and c, that they pray for us. All that is proved by Holy Scripture, and the proof is concluded by an excerpt from a decree of a council, quote, if anyone does not confess that all the saints who have been since eternity and who have pleased God, as before the law, so also under the law and under grace, are worthy before him of honor in their souls and bodies, or if he does not invoke the prayers of the saints as having the permission to mediate for the world according to the church tradition, anathema, end quote. That is, obviously, a sufficient proof. 255c. The worship of holy relics and of other reminders of those who have pleased God. Besides, it is necessary also to glorify the relics and other remainders of the saints. That is proved. Quote, a. Because when a dead man barely touched the body of prophet Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. c. Because the mantle of Elijah, which was left by him to Elisha, with its touch opened the waters of the Jordan for the passage of the latter prophet. That even the handkerchiefs and aprons of St. Paul, which in his absence were put on those who suffered from diseases or were possessed by devils, cured the diseases and drove out the devils. 2. In the history of the church, we find an endless number of similar miracles which the Lord has performed through the relics and other remainders of the saints for all those who had recourse to them with faith. 3. The most startling miracle with which the Lord has glorified the bodies of many saints is their incorruptibility. This incorruptibility of the holy relics, this exemption of theirs through the miraculous divine action from the universal law of corruption, serving, as it were, as a living lesson of their future resurrection and as strong incitement to us to worship the very bodies of the saints who are glorified by God and to emulate their faith is not subject to the slightest doubt. In Kiev and Novgorod, in Moscow and Vologda, and in many other places of our divinely guarded country, openly rest many incorruptible relics of saints, and by the incessant miracles which are wrought on those who have recourse to them in faith, they loudly testify to the truth of their incorruptibility. End quote. All of us know about the Duc de Croix, of hundreds and hundreds of incorruptible bodies due to physical conditions. We know that accidentally a certain Siberian bishop did not decompose and is now lying in Kiev in a cellar waiting for the opening of the relics. We know of those relics that are kept under a bushel, about the scarecrows with which pennies are gathered in for the hierarchy and whose garments are clandestinely changed by the members of the hierarchy. We know about the oil which is poured into the fragrance-spreading heads. Not a single student of a seminary, nor a peasant, believes in all that. 
so what sense is there in expounding it in the theology as a dogma even if there were in the theology anything resembling a disclosure of the truth of faith even if everything were sensible and correct in it such an assertion about the relics would invalidate the whole thing the proof is given that the relics and all kinds of handkerchiefs and pantaloons have to be honored and kissed and that pennies are to be put on them and the whole concludes with a decree of the seventh ecumenical council quote, and thus those who dared to reject the relics of the martyrs which they know to be genuine and true if they are bishops or clergymen let them be deposed if they are monks or laymen let them be deprived of communion end quote. but all that is not enough it's not enough to substitute saints their fingers and pantaloons in the place of god we need still the images two fifty six d the worship of the holy images the church commands us a to use images in churches houses and streets b to honor them with a burning and offering of tapers and it condemns a the ancient iconoclasts b the modern protestants c those who worship them as though they were gods there begin proofs and controversies those controversies have cost much malice many executions much blood only by an absolute departure from the questions of faith can we explain those controversies and those assertions and proofs which are adduced in the book Quote, section three the endless signs and miracles which the lord has been pleased to perform through the images for the believers serve as a new incitement for the worship of the holy images with accounts of these miracles are filled the chronicles of the church in general as also of our church in particular several images of christ the saviour of his immaculate mother of saint nicholas and of other saints have on account of the abundance of miracles wrought by them since antiquity been known under the name of miracle-working images and being found in various places of the orthodox church by the will of god our benefactor have not yet ceased to be as it were channels or guides of his miraculous power which gives us salvation end quote. it is for these channels of his miraculous power that controversies have existed and differences of opinion still exist the question is whether they are channels or not if the lord has deigned to work miracles through those images then not only a rude peasant but even the greatest philosopher cannot help but pray to the image if a case is decided through a secretary the secretary has to be invoked and there is no way out of it we have long ago descended upon the earth from the sphere of questions about religion the discussion was about sacraments which mechanically impart grace independently of the spiritual condition of the pastor and believer only when there are no causes for cassation and now the subject under discussion is the images which are channels of miraculous power and which therefore have to be prayed to though they are not gods about the history of these channels we learn from theology that during the first three centuries quote, the pagans at times rebukingly asked the christians why they had no certain representations because quote, one of the councils in spain the one at elvira which took place in the year three o five in its thirty-sixth rule directly forbade the use of images in temples but a first of all this rule incontestably proves that images were then in use in the churches b this rule forbade men to represent upon the walls of their temples that which the christians worshipped that is as is assumed to represent god in his substance which is invisible and unrepresentable c not improbable is another guess which is that the rule was enunciated in conformity with the conditions of place and time in spain just then raged the diocletian persecution and the pagans who frequently broke into the temples desecrated the holy representations of the lord and his saints and so in order to avoid that this rule was adopted for a certain time end quote. 257 retribution to sinners a their punishment to hell quote, the sinners suddenly after death and the private judgment depart with their souls to a place of sorrow and grief end quote proofs from holy scripture the place to which they depart is called the extreme darkness a fiery furnace not all agree where that gehenna is but there are several subdivisions in hell Quote, it may be assumed that hell has its separate abodes lock-ups and dungeons of the souls its separate divisions of which one is properly called hell another gehenna a third tartarus a fourth a fiery lake and so forth at least there is in revelation a passage where hell and the lake of fire are distinguished 
these unequal torments of the sinners in hell after the private judgment are not full and complete but only anticipatory End quote. proofs from holy scripture 258 b the possibility which some sinners have of receiving alleviation and even immunity from their punishment in hell because of the prayers of the church quote, however while the orthodox church teaches that all sinners after their death and the private judgment over them all alike depart to hell a place of sorrow and of grief it at the same time confesses that for those who have repented before their departure from the present life but have not had time to bring the fruits which are worthy of repentance such as prayer contrition the consolation of the poor and the expression in acts of love for god and for their neighbors there is still left a chance of getting alleviation in sufferings and even of being completely freed from the bonds of hell such an alleviation and immunity the sinners may obtain not through any of their own deserts or through repentance for after death and the private judgment there is no place either for repentance or for deserts but only through the infinite grace of god through the prayers of the church and through the benefactions done by the living for the dead and especially through the power of the bloodless sacrifice which in particular the servants of the church bring for every christian and for the deceased and which the catholic and apostolic church in general brings every day for all End quote. that is proved that natural consideration how if god is just as a man is just as the hierarchy understands it he can forgive a sinner for somebody else's prayers is decided in the following way quote, saint augustine quote, there is no cause for the slightest doubt that they the prayers of the holy church saving sacrifices and alms are beneficial to the dead but only to those who before their death have lived in such a way that they can be beneficial to them for in behalf of those who have departed without faith which is accompanied by charity and without the communion in the sacraments their friends will in vain perform the works of that godliness an earnest of which they did not have in themselves when they were here and when they did not receive or vainly received divine grace and treasured up for themselves not mercy but wrath thus no new deserts are obtained for the dead when their friends do something good in their behalf but the consequences are extracted from the foundations which they have laid before End quote. what good is there then in prayers is it possible god will not make out the foundations which they have laid before without the mediation of advocates what use is there then in the prayers and sacrifices of the church however disagreeable it is to say so there is no other cause for them except that of collecting pennies indeed this natural heartfelt sentiment of every praying person in addressing god to remember the souls of friends this holy this good sentiment the hierarchy by its touch has managed to change into something stupid base and degrading then follow reflections about the prayers of the church one the deceased are divided into those for whom it is necessary to pray and into those for whom it is not necessary to pray the unrepenting and the stubborn two there is a refutal of the opinions of those who assert that there is no need of praying for those who have passed away having received the last sacrament on the ground that they are holy as it is three it is proved that it is necessary to pray for them four prayers have an effect only on the private judgment the same reflection by st augustine as quoted above that prayer is a kind of remembrance six that there are some who can no longer be saved by prayers while others may be saved seven the church prays quote, on the third day for the sake of him who on the third day rose from the dead on the ninth day in commemoration of the living and of the dead on the fortieth because for that length of time the people lamented moses End quote. eight in case we pray for those who are already quote, in heaven or among the number of the rejected End quote. the prayers quote, though no longer useful to them can do them no harm End quote. nine quote, if the church prays for all who have died in repentance and its prayers are very strong before god and beneficial to them then all will be saved and no one shall be deprived of bliss to that we shall say let it be so and oh if it were so End quote. 259 c remarks about purgatory controversy with the catholics about purgatory and proofs that they are in the wrong section 260 
the moral application of the dogma about the private judgment and retribution naturally is to be afraid of the judgment and have recourse to the relics and images and pay money to the hierarchy that it may pray for the departed section two on the general judgment two sixty one connection with what precedes the day of the general judgment the uncertainty of that day and signs of its approach especially the appearance of the antichrist Quote, the private judgment to which every man is subjected after his death is not the complete and final judgment and so naturally makes us wait for another the full and decisive judgment at the private judgment the soul receives its award without any participation of the body although the body has shared with its good and bad works after the private judgment the righteous in heaven and the sinners in hell have opened unto them only an anticipation of that happiness or torment which they have deserved finally after the private judgment a few sinners still have a chance to alleviate their fate and even to free themselves from the bonds of hell if not through their own deserts at least through the prayers of the church but the day the last day will certainly come for the whole human race End quote. the day will come when the body will receive according to its deserts then are defined the symptoms of that day quote, one on the one hand extraordinary successes of good upon the earth the dissemination of christ's gospel in the whole world two on the other hand extraordinary successes of evil and the appearance of the antichrist upon earth End quote. this is who the antichrist is going to be quote, a it will be a definite person by all means a man but only a lawless man under the special operation of satan b he will in his character be distinguished by extraordinary pride and will give himself out as a god c for the purpose of attaining his end he will preach a false doctrine which is contrary to the saving faith of christ an enticing teaching with which he will draw after him many weak and unworthy people d in confirmation of his teaching and for the greater seduction of men he will perform false signs and miracles e finally he will perish from the actions of jesus christ the saviour when he comes to judge the living and the dead we shall further remark a he will come from the tribe of dan b he will be a powerful lord who will usurp the power by force and will extend his dominion over all the nations c he will cause a terrible persecution of the christians will demand divine worship of himself will draw many after him and those who will not follow him he will put to death d for the counteraction to the antichrist god will send from heaven two witnesses who as is said in revelation shall prophesy the truth and work miracles and when they shall have finished their testimony they shall be killed by a dragon and after three days and a half they shall rise from the dead and ascend to heaven e the dominion of the antichrist will last only three years and a half End quote. all that is proved by holy scripture quote, it will not be superfluous to remark that the predictions about the antichrist have more than once been applied to various persons some according to the testimony of st augustine saw the antichrist in nero others saw him in the gnostics others again in the pontiff at rome and in general in the popery an idea which arose and was quite common in the middle ages in the west among many sectarians but which became especially strengthened with the appearance of protestant communities and which has penetrated into their theological systems and has many times been discussed in special works and so forth End quote. the author does not mention that the greater part of the russian people regards our hierarchy as the hierarchy of the antichrist two sixty two events which are to take place on the day of the general judgment and their order quote, the actions of the antichrist on earth will last to the very judgment day End quote. 263 the premonitory circumstances of the general judgment a the arrival of the lord judge over the living and the dead on that day the lord jesus christ will come down upon earth everything is proved by holy scripture 264 b the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living Quote, on that last day and just at the time that the glorious descent of the lord upon earth surrounded by those who live in heaven will take place he shall send before him with a great sound of a trumpet and the dead shall hear the voice of the son of god for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel 
and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive shall be changed. End quote. That is, in Russian, first of all the dead shall arise, and then the living shall be changed. It is proved by Holy Scripture that there shall certainly be a resurrection of the dead, and that the possibility of the resurrection of the dead cannot be subject to doubt. This is the way it is proved. Quote, in the world, nothing is destroyed or annihilated, but everything remains whole in the power and in the right hand of the Almighty. Our bodies lose their existence through death only for us, but not for God, who knows full well all the smallest particles of each dead body, though they may be scattered everywhere, and may be united with other bodies, and is always able to reunite those particles into the former organism." End quote. When it comes to talking about particles, the question is not about replacing the particles, but about the fact that there will not be enough particles to go around. The body of my great-grandfather is rotten. Parts of his body have gone into the grass. A cow has eaten the grass. A peasant boy has drunk those parts in his milk, and these particles have become his body, and his body has rotted. There will not be enough particles to go around, so that it is absolutely impossible for God to do that by means of the particles. It would be better to prove that in the old way like this. Quote, a. In reply to the objection that the resurrection of the dead is incomprehensible to us, men have pointed to other, not less incomprehensible things, such as the birth of each man, the original formation of the human body out of the dust, the creation of the world out of nothing, and so forth. End quote. That proves the possibility of the resurrection in the body, and the necessity of it is proved like this. Quote, By the very nature of Christianity, it is necessary that, as in Adam, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, and that not only our first enemy, the devil, but also our last enemy, death, shall be destroyed. Otherwise the purpose of Christ's descent upon earth, the purpose of the whole Christianity, will not be fully realized. Man will not all be saved, his enemies will not all be vanquished, and in Christ we shall receive less than we have lost in Adam. According to their qualities, the resurrected bodies, one, will be essentially the same as they have been in connection with certain souls during their life upon earth, two, but, on the other hand, they will also be distinct from the present bodies, because they will arise in a transformed state in resemblance to the resurrected body of Christ the Savior. They will be a. incorruptible and immortal, b. glorious or light-bearing, c. strong and sound, d. spiritual. We shall all of us have eternal bodies, but not all alike. If one is righteous, he will receive a heavenly body, in which he will be able properly to have relations with the angels. But if one is sinful, he will receive an eternal body, which is to suffer torments for sins, in order to burn forever in fire, and not to be destroyed. Some have thought that after the resurrection of the bodies, the distinction of sexes will be abolished. Others, on the contrary, have assumed that the distinction will remain. Others, again, that all the dead will rise as males, an opinion against which St. Augustine has armed himself. Some have divined that all the dead, old men, middle-aged men, youths, and children, will rise as being of one age, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Others have said that they will not be of the same age, though they have not admitted that babes and youths would rise in their respective ages, but have thought that they would rise at a maturer age. Besides the resurrection of the dead, there is disclosed also the mystery in regard to those whom the judgment will find still living and who will be transformed in a very short time. End of section 27. Recording by Olivia.